Yeah, welcome to the American methods. And what I like to do in this session is to discuss a little bit software development tools. So we make another small excursus. Uh, and I believe this topic is quite helpful maybe to solve the project. As you know, in the project, you should work in a team together. And I would like to point you to some nice tools yeah, that are especially useful if you work together in a group. But uh, you can also use these tools maybe in some other contexts. So what I would like to discuss is first, I will again give you a short overview of a version control using Git. Yeah, I assume that you are familiar with Git already, but maybe it's nice to see that again. And then I will discuss a little bit build management. So there is Maven and Cradle are the maybe the most prominent examples for build management. So build management tools. And this build management tools also allows us to yeah, um, run other tasks, yeah, except from compiling the code. For example, also running tests, creating documentation, running checks on your code. And I will also discuss then all these parts and always show you how you can run it from the build management tool. So there are many other tasks like testing, unit testing, creating documentation, checking your code style, static analysis. Yeah. And then in the end, we could integrate this into to some server. Let's start with a small review of Git. Okay, so Git is a distributed version control system. So two parts, version control, you can do a versioning of changes you did so that you can maybe roll back to a previous state yeah, of your code. Yeah? So you can revert changes and then it's distributed. So there are different instances of these so-called uh, repositories. And of course there are some commands that allow to synchronize the changes from uh, one repository to the other one. So the main thing is that it allows to track changes in files. And maybe this is already a small tip here or a small hint. You could also use Git to track changes in other works you do. For example, if you write a master thesis in LaTeX, then it's maybe nice to track all the changes under a Git repository because maybe you have deleted a file yeah, and you would like to go back to a version of your um, yeah, work of the whole directory uh, that was there a month ago. Yeah? Then you can step through the history and go, can go back. Yeah? So each Git repository keeps a complete history of the changes to the files. Uh, I will make this more precise on the next slides. First, let's discuss how we get this. So you clone, copy a remote repository using the command git clone and then the name of the repository. Maybe I just do this. So we have here, for example, our group project on local volatility, yeah, which is distributed as a Git repository. And if that is on GitHub, there is here the URL where you can find this. So I just copy that to the clipboard. So that's now the URL of the repository. And then I can issue the command git clone this repository, yeah, it can end with .git, or you can also leave that out. That doesn't matter, that doesn't change anything. And he's now creating a local copy, 
a local repository of this remote repository. So in this remote repository, you find here all kind of code changes, code. And now I have a local copy in this directory here. So we can enter this directory. And I have a local copy of, of this. Okay, so if that was just creating clone, creating a local repository. If somebody is now making changes to the remote repository, I can synchronize the chain, these changes with my local repository using git pull. Huh? So if I issue git pull, I can pull changes from the remote repository into my local repository. Okay, for the local repository, actually the story is a little bit more complex. There is a working copy where you can change your files and there is the local repository. And actually these two things are different. And you also see this here in the folder we now have locally on my computer. This is actually here my working copy where I can work so I can maybe change, for example, this file. And here in this hidden folder .git is the local repository that stores the complete history of all changes. You can enter this hidden directory and you can maybe have a look at this. Okay, there is some database, some index, yeah, some, some stuff. Okay, so that here is actually just our working copy. So now we can work on this. So maybe I draw this a little bit here. So there is the working copy. Where you can change files and then there is the local repository. And you somewhat have to tell him that you would like to keep a change in your local repository versioned. So he will not track all the changes you do. Um, he will only track the changes that you commit. So maybe we can just exercise this. I now have checked out this project so I can import it in Eclipse. So it's a Maven project. I will come to Maven in the next session. So let's import it. Okay, so now I have here the project and I could now work on this. So for example, I could make a small change here to the readme file. Okay, so maybe just a stupid test. Okay, and then, yeah, you could, you see, he is showing us here there are untracked changes. So these changes are in my working copy, not yet tracked. Okay, I can just also remove this here again. Okay, he's still telling me there's an untracked change. If I click here, I see the change. The change is that I added an empty line. Okay, so he's still noticing that there's a change, but the line that I have just deleted is not in the lo local repository in the history. So that line is lost. Okay, so maybe I remove this empty line and you see there's no untracked change, but maybe I could fix this typo here. And then I would like to keep this change tracked. So keeping this change tracked now consists of two steps. I have to tell him that I would like to have this tracked, this versioned, and then I have to commit it to my local repository. So now we have two commands. Git add will add a file to the so-called staging area and git commit will then move the file to the local repository, track the changes in the local repository.
Okay, so that was the difference between the working copy and the local repository. So Git does not maintain a history of all changes to your working copy. Instead, you have to commit the changes you like to have tracked. So the command add is telling which changes would we like to now have committed to the local repository and commit is then committing this. You can do this very nicely here in Eclipse. So actually pressing this plus here will move the file here down to the staging area. This is equivalent to git add the file. And then I can enter here a commit message, fix the typo, and I can press commit and this will commit the change to my local repository. Maybe I don't do this here in Eclipse. It's much more convenient here, but I do it on the command line. So maybe I would like to do one other thing. I would like to maybe add a new file. Let's also add a new file by adding, say, a class, say a class called a vector and Maybe this is here our local volatility project. Maybe the class has nothing to do with the local volatility project. So I just call it demo. So now I have a new file, which is also a change, but that file is not under version control. So whether you change the file and you would like to add the change to your local repository or whether you create a new file and you would like to have this file in the local repository, this is no difference. I have to add it. Yeah? So it also appears here, but now with the question mark there, and I have to add these guys here and you can then commit, commit this. Maybe I do this on the command line with the two commands. So you can issue git status yeah? and you will see that, for example, the readme file is uh, modified and that there is also here a new directory yeah, which contains untracked files. Yeah? So now we do a git add the readme file and I go do a git and then maybe this whole folder or just my vector, oops. Yeah, I forgot the add. maybe just the vector.java. Yeah? So now if you issue git status, you see that he will consider these two modification packed together and now I can commit it, git commit. And I can add a small message here, yeah? fix the typo and edit first version of class vector. Okay. so. If you go back to Eclipse, you see that there are no more untracked changes. Now the changes in my are in my local repository, but you see there is a small indicator here that in my local repository, there's new stuff, one new stuff, and in the remote repository that is missing. You can look at the history of all the changes in, for example, your local repository also nicely here in Eclipse. If you open show history, and then you see that this is here my last commit, fix the typo and edit first version of class vector. And you see that the files that were changed are these two. You can click here on the file and you can see the difference that it was made to this file, okay? So you can step back and look what I did here before, yeah? So you see, I made a few small changes here before to this little project. Okay, so we have this staging area which is just telling which files I would like to update or commit to the local repository. Yeah, so some 
changes here, I now move to the staging area using the command add, and then I do the command commit. And I have the files now tracked in my local repository and I can go back to earlier commits. So at this point, I have moved changes from, from my working copy to the local repository. The next step is that I would like to see the others that also have maybe pulled something from the remote repository, see my changes by moving them to the remote repository such that others can pull from the remote repository. And this command is then called push. Yeah, so git push is pushing all recent commits to the remote repository. Actually, you can do the push also after several commits. For example, if here in my vector, yeah, I maybe would like to continue and work a little bit. So maybe I add some members yeah, to the vector and I need to create a constructor. Okay, so I have updated my vector. Then I can move here again to Git. I see there are changes. I add it to the staging area and I write a small commit message, improved implementation of vector. And I can now commit this to my local repository. You see now there are two changes. If you look in the history, you see that there are two commits here because this here is the status of the remote repository. This was my first commit. This was my second commit. You can also read this here, git, state, git status. Uh, your branch is ahead by two commits, which means that here in the remote repository, I'm still here on this commit. So the commit has some kind of an ID, uh, 84DE978. It has this mes message. Yeah, you see, this is the 84DE978 with this matches. This is the latest version, the latest commit in the remote repository. So let's push the stuff to the remote repository. Okay, so now he's pushing the stuff to the remote repository. I can have a look at the remote repository. And you see improved implementation of Vector two minutes ago with the new IT has been added here. If now a coworker likes to use your new version, he will issue git pull. So getting the commits from others that were moved to the remote repository is then done with git pull, pulls the commits from the remote repository. So my picture is now like this, that we have here the remote repository. also sometimes called origin. And then if I would like to push the commits to this, I use git push. And I would like, if I would like to get the commits, I use pull, which if there is no conflict, will also um, update here my working copy. So actually there could now be two different conflicts. There could be in your local repository, a change to a file that has been changed also in the remote repository, or there could be a change in your working copy that has not been committed to the local repository, but um, that is in a file that had been changed also in the remote repository. In that case, you have to resolve this um, um, issues. And after you have resolved it, you can 
add it again and and and, and pu push it again. And this process is then called uh, merging. So we have the push and the pull. Okay, so a few more advanced topics are branches, pull requests, and merging. So now if you work together with your colleagues on, say, a larger project, and you work on some part that requires maybe multiple steps until it is complete. So maybe you do not like to have all the changes pushed into the remote repository because that will maybe disturb um, the work of your coworkers. Maybe you would like to have your remote repository on an earlier version, but still move with the new feature, let's call it feature, step-by-step uh, step, uh, using several commits, pushing these new features to the um, remote repository. So what you can do is you can create a branch. And actually, so you could say that there are then two different remote repositories. Say there is the origin on the main branch and there's the origin on some other branch. And there is a certain point when you were branching so this here contains the same commits as the main branch, but then you could say that your push to this branch. So there are changes here, which are not in the main branch. So that means that a coworker could still look at the main branch and see the old status, but you already pushed new stuff to the other branch and another co-worker could say, okay, I have a look at that and I will use this new version. And if you are confident, you can then merge these changes here to the main branch. This creating the request to merge this into the main branch is then sometimes called um, a pull request. So you can tell your coworker to perform um, such a pull request. So let me just review these words and maybe you can read a little bit about this in the documentation. Yeah, there are nice, nice websites, nice uh, uh, tutorials for Git. So a branch is useful if you would like to have your changes copied to the remote repository. For example, they should be tested by one of your coworkers, but others should not yet be bothered, be disturbed by these changes. So you create a branch and you commit everything to such a branch. Uh, so all the commands, so you move to the branch and all the commands then just work on this branch. Um, a, a merge is then taking the commits from one branch and move it to another branch. And you can also create the request that these commits should be merged by a colleague. Yeah, and this then sometimes called pull request uh, or merge request. So if you like, we can maybe exercise this a little bit. So maybe I would like to create here yeah, some, some change, but now I would like to create it on a branch. So in Eclipse, this is maybe easy. I can create here switch to and say new branch. And for example, uh, there are some conventions on how to name these branches. For example, one convention is to name these branches as feature branches, feature, and then you describe what kind of feature it is. Yeah. So um, experimental vector implementation. So maybe that is now my branch. So now I move to this branch. Eclipse will also show you that you are now on this branch here in this 
bracket. Okay. And now all my Git commands are uh, on this branch. So maybe I create uh, a method. So a method that is double length. Yeah? So let's have a length of this vector. The length of this vector is the square root of x plus y squared, x squared plus y squared. So this is my length. This is my experimental implementation of the vector. And now I would like to commit this. So I do all the steps now in Eclipse. Yeah. So I would like to commit here my change. This is my change. I can always look at my change. I would like to commit this, but you see now it's committed to feature experimental vector implementation. And I added the length method. So you can say commit and then push, or you can say commit and push. So he will immediately push it. And you see that he's now pushing it also to the other branch. That means if I go back now to the remote repository, which is here my remote repository, you still see that there is no change. Yeah, It's still the 833820C improved implementation of Vector 11 minutes ago. But you see there is here a branch has been added. So you can also switch here the branches on GitHub. So people working here on this remote repository will not yet see the changes, but you could say to one of your code workers, okay, I'm working now on a branch. Maybe you could have a look and maybe we could work together. So if you have a group of 10, three people could work on one branch, three other people could work on another branch, something like that. You can also have a look again at the history here. And you see that there is the main branch, which is in sync with the origin main. And there is my feature branch, which is in sync with the origin feature branch. So now if you have made multiple commits, so maybe I can make another commit to this. Okay, so maybe I add a little bit Java documentation. Okay, I add a little bit of documentation and I also commit this. So you see that here in my history, the branch is moving up. In my remote repository, I'm still here in the main branch on the out code, but now you can create this pull request. So you can either now merge this branch to the main branch in Eclipse. So maybe you can do, we can also have a look at this here. So if I would like to go back to the main branch, I say team switch to, and now I can select which branch I go to main. And you see he's going to the version where this method is missing and I do not see the changes. So now I'm on the main branch. I can say now team merge. If I would like to have the changes from this experimental branch reflected in my main branch. Yeah? So he will move these changes into my main branch. You can do this here, or you can create in GitHub a so-called pull request. So compare and create pull request. So you see it, this will move all the changes from that branch to the main branch and you can leave a small comment. Yeah? So we have worked on this improvement for a while and believe it can be merged to the main branch. Please have a look and you create the pull request, which means that your colleagues see now 
the commits you added. They can also look at the files that, that have been changed here. Uh, so it's very comfortable and they can add a small conversation here and then they can press the merge button. You see that here is that we have all checks failed here. This is our unit testing. I will comment on the unit testing later. So maybe I just merge this. I confirm the merge and now GitHub is performing the merge, not here. Huh? So locally, I have two branches, main in the old state, feature branch in the updated state. Remote, the main has been updated. So if I go back to the repository, <coughs> you will now see that there is an additional commit, merge pull request from this branch. And the implementation, if you dig down here, now reflects the new method. Which means that in order to see this here on my main branch, I have to do a pull. So I do git pull. I can do that here. I could also do it in the console. So maybe I also illustrate this. If you um, say git status, he says your branch is up to date with origin main, but this is not true. The reason is he doesn't know that in the remote repository, there was a change. To tell him that he should check if there was a change, there's another command, which I do not have on the, on the slides. It's called git fetch. So by git fetch, he is updating his information, what has happened to the remote repository. If you now issue git status, you see that I am now behind by three commits. Three commits were the two commits I made to the feature branch plus the merge. So now I can issue git pull and he is updating my vector implementation and this should be reflected here. Yeah. So now if you reopen the vector, you see there is the change and I also have the two additional commits here. Okay, so now if you look at the history, so you see that the history becomes a little bit more complex. Yeah. So you see there is this branching between the main and the feature and there is this merging. Yeah. So it's de depicted here. That was maybe a nice little tour on working with Git and you can maybe exercise this working, working as a group. So we have a few examples of repositories. Yeah, we have our mathematical finance library, yeah, which you can find there. We have our um, small experiments. Some are here and some are in the lecture repository. And maybe you can exercise these steps, yeah? code session practice, some of these steps we already did. So now I would like to talk about build management. All the projects we have here in this lecture are Maven projects. So Maven is a build management tool. So what's that? So software is usually written in source code, for example, Java files, yeah? but the computer is not directly interpreting these source codes files. In case of Java, he is uh, running the class files. So the Java files are compiled to bytecode, so-called bytecode, the so class files. In other languages, maybe there are other compile processes. So, and this compile step is one part of the build process. Yeah? So compiling is maybe the central part of the build process. It converts your human readable written code into code that can be run and understood by the machine. But there are other parts that are also part of the build process. For example, generating documentation or running automated tests. And a build management tool is helping to keep these steps 
organized. Two nice examples are Maven, which we use here, and Cradle. So Maven is a build management tool and it configures your project in a so-called pom.xml file. So the pom.xml is the project um, object model. And in this file, you specify many different things related to your project. One important part is that we maintain the dependencies. So if your project is using some library, I can specify that my project needs this library and Maven will take care of the fact that he, we need this library. So he will even download the library from the internet, download the right version, put the library in the right place so that when I um, run a test or whatever, then this library can be used. And he is also maintaining the configuration of so-called plugins, these plugins control all these different build steps. So the build steps like uh, compile, test, create the documentation. I have a look at these steps um, later because we will also discuss testing and documentation. So first part is dependencies. If your project uses code from some other party, a library, for example, Apache Common Math is a mathematical library, which I sometimes use. Or if you work on your project, you can use the FinMat library. So the one where we have developed our Monte Carlo simulation framework, you may use that. Um, or if I like to use Apache Common Math, or there is Apache Common Lang, or there is uh, um, yeah, many other libraries, then I specify that I have this dependency. Maybe I can have a look. And for example, here, the file related to our group project has the pom.xml file. And first it states a little bit the name of our project. Yeah? So this is some kind of artifact ID or a human readable name. And then you find here some of the dependencies. For example, this project uses, or is now allowed to use, uh, the Apache Common Math 3 library in this version. So once you specify this dependency here, he will automatically download the stuff uh, from the internet and put it in the right place. Sometimes you see here placeholder. Yeah, so the version, for example, for this library, this is then just the property which I specify here because sometimes you like to update the versions at a single, a single spot. Okay, so you have some dependencies. If you have checked out this library, for example, we have here our Finmatlib. You can also have a look at this POM file. Okay, this guy file is maybe a bit more lengthy, but you can also have a look at this files, uh, this project dependencies. So there is a dependency on something that has a dependency, and he will make sure that all these parts are just downloaded and available. Okay, so this means that we have dependencies. So since now our project here has a dependency to Apache Common Math, actually we could use this library here in our code. Yeah, so this means that when I write here org Apache Math Commons Math, that I have access to this library. Yeah, so you can maybe create your distribution. Uh, gamma distribution, you, you have now access to this library. So this is because the dependency is mentioned here. So in addition to dependencies, there are plugins and plugins control uh, individual parts of the build steps. For example, compile, test, documentation, and 
so on. So the plugins are configured in the plugin section. You do not need to configure all plugins, some are built in, but there are many plugins on the internet. Yeah? So if we go to the plugin section, you see that I'm configuring here the compiler to compile this as Java 17 code. This here is the Surefire plugin, which will run the tests. And this here is the check style plugin, which will run checks on my code. I will comment on, on check style. And this here is the Java doc plugin, which is generating the documentation. Okay, and for example, here check style is here configured to use this check style file. So with the plugin, you can configure certain build steps. Maybe we have a look at build steps later. Yeah, so I will have a look at these, these examples now. Okay, so code session, have a look at the pom.xml for different different projects and check it out. Yeah, what, what, what is configured there. So now we wrote um, a Java class. Yeah, okay, so we wrote here our vector. Yeah, and maybe it's nice to write um, a test if this class really works as expected. So this technique is then called unit testing or even test-driven development. Test-driven development is if you write your test very early, even maybe before you do the implementation, you can write the test. If you have an interface, just some stub implementation, you could just write the test. The test will fail yeah? and um, you can then improve your code until your test is yes, uh, successful. So there are frameworks for this testing. For example, one framework is JUnit for our Java code. So JUnit is a unit test framework. And maybe I illustrate this. I have some assistance here by Eclipse because he has just a menu for this. Create a new JUnit test case for this class vector. Okay, so now I have here this test case and the test is implemented here as to fail. Yeah? So that's the default implementation. So maybe I do some test here. You can also rename here the test. Yeah. So for example, that this is only the test for the method length. And I create now a new vector. So maybe a vector three, four. And the length of this vector is nine plus 16, 25 square root is five. So it means that the test should be successful if the length of this vector is five. Maybe there can be some tolerance. Yeah, you can work with tolerance. Let's maybe test this. And for these things, there are the so-called assertions. So assertions are now conditions you can formulate that have to be true. So for example, I do assertions assert equals, and then the first argument is what is expected. So expected and actual, you see. Uh, so what is expected is a five, and the actual value is vector dot length. Okay, so let's let's check if this test is true. So I can run now this unit test also here in Eclipse. Run as J unit test and the test will be successful. But maybe we are now cool programmers and we run this with Maven. Yeah? So you can just run Maven test and he will run all your unit tests. Okay, and now my project already contains some other tests. Yeah, this is our sample project or group project, and there are two other tests already inside. One test was just a small demo of a Monte Carlo method, and the other test was um, 
also just a stop implementation, which was not yet implemented. And this test is failing. Uh, so you see he ran three tests and one is failing and failing is this guy here. So this guy is in our project just here and it's just a stop that illustrated, okay, this is how a test looks like. I just comment this out for a while. Yeah? So for this demo here, and if I now run the test again, he will run all the unit tests in this project. There are three unit tests in this project and all the tests are successful, okay? Three tests have been run, all the tests have been successful. So the three tests are that one here that is, uh, was part from the, of the project from the beginning. This one here, which is just an example of a more complicated test and the one on my vector. Assume my vector has an error. Yeah? So now assume that I did a mistake doing some update, even later, yeah, I could have done a mistake. Maybe this Y squared here was missing and there's just a Y, a stupid typo. And now I can run the test and you will see that this test will now fail and I get some, some message. Okay, so you see vector test test length expected five, but was 3.6 failed. So maybe I commit now these changes to my repository and yeah, maybe I fix this here. And I have now a clean project. So let's me maybe commit this to my repository. So we added a unit test. Then in my remote repository, I have created a configuration that whenever I commit something to the remote repository, a test is run. Yeah, all the unit tests are run. So you find this here under actions. So these are the so-called GitHub actions. And you see that here are all the recent commits. All these commits have red cross. So all these have failing tests, but now I have fixed my project, all the tests are now, should now be successful. So there should be now a green check mark popping up here. Okay. So this is called continuous integration. So there is a server that whenever you make a change to the remote repository, whenever you integrate new features, he is continuously checking this project. Yeah? Also very nice to use this when you work together. Your project is already configured in a way that he runs these tests. Okay, so that was uh, unit testing. And you also see now the link to Maven. I can run all unit tests with a single command. Maybe just to, to finish this. The magic that is going on here is the following. Maven test knows how to start the JUnit framework. So this Surefire plugin knows how to, how to start the JUnit framework. And the JUnit framework will now do the following. He will look at all methods that have this annotation on top. And then he will instantiate an object of this class. The class has to have a constructor that takes no argument and call this method on this class. So this is all fully automatic just by specifying this little word here. Okay, so by specifying this little word, you say, this is a test that should be run if I issue this command here. So this makes life really easy. Yeah, you can add a new test by just adding this word. And this test is also run remotely here by just having this word on top. Okay, that's the J unit framework. Now, another part of the build step is writing documentation. And there's Java doc, which is a standard yeah, of writing documentation. And 
the documentation, you could also say I create a separate LaTeX file or a separate Word document or whatever, yeah, open office uh, document. Um, that has a disadvantage. If you create your doc documentation in a different location, the programmer will make changes to the code and he is maybe too lazy or he forgets about um, updating the documentation. So it is a big advantage to have the documentation very close to the code. Actually, as close as possible. And for that, we have here the Java doc. So we write our documentation in a certain standard in comments. And the comment, the Java doc comment starts with a slash star star. I already did this to my vector class. So I have here the Java doc comment. And you see the Java stock has certain yeah, keywords that start with the at that will tell me something about a special property. For example, that this guy here yeah, returns um, a value, it's not void, and then I can describe what it returns. In Eclipse, Java doc is nice because if you do a slash star star and then press enter, he will somehow populate already the Java doc, and you can write um, some documentation. Uh, sometimes the Java docs are well not very helpful, yeah, because they are just trivial repetitions of what this is done. Yeah, so that's maybe not what you should do, but you could describe a little bit more um, in this part here. Yeah? where you can document um, the constructor or where you can document the class. So this here creates a 2D vector. And you can also have a Java doc here, which documents the whole class. And you can also specify who is the author. If you have multiple authors, you can add another author. Uh, and uh, then you, you see which of your co-workers did or which part. Yeah? So this here is a simple implementation of a 2D vector. Yeah? And you can describe a little bit the class. Um, yeah, I can now generate the Java doc. The Java doc is actually an HTML page. And there is a Maven build process part, build step, that generates this documentation. So I can issue Maven Java doc, Java doc, and he will now generate this HTML documentation. Okay, so you see he has generated this documentation and he has generated several web pages, yeah, an index and so on. So maybe I have a look at this web page here. So the web pages are, this is here my project in target site API docs. And there you find this index. Maybe I just opened this guy. Okay, so this is now the Java doc of my uh, little project. So meanwhile, I have added the package info files. The package info files describe what is going on in this package and they can also have a Java doc. And you see that this Java doc is actually just appearing here. So I have two packages, my little demo here for this, this part of the session, our original project. So the demo contains the implementation of the vector. I can click on the vector and you see here the documentation, a simple implementation of a 2D vector, which is what I have written here. You see also the author and here, here below, you see the constructor details, the X coordinate and the Y coordinate. My Java doc is configured in a way that he will only show public method. Actually, this can be configured here in the Maven pom.xml file. So, um, you can here configure what kind of method gets a documentation. And the default is that only public method 
for only public methods, he will create a documentation. Uh, you can look this uh, plugin, the Maven Java doc plugin up in the internet, and you will see that um, you can also configure it in different, uh, in different ways. So my method length here is not public. Maybe I would like to make it public. I create now the Java doc again. And if you move to the web page, you see that here below, I also now have method details and there is my documentation of the length method. Yeah, there is the length method. Okay, so we can so we can run a Java doc nicely using the Maven command, and the result is put into this directory here. Yeah? A very nice thing is that I can also include LaTeX in the Java doc. Um, as you maybe know, there is a JavaScript library, MathJax, which allows me to use LaTeX. And I can now configure um, the Java doc plugin of Maven that he should include the JavaScript library that allows to use LaTeX in the generated HTML. So this is already done in this project. So if you work on this project here, it's already done. But you see this here is the header of the HTML page. And I'm including here the MathJax JavaScript. So all my Java doc has now this library. I can use in the HTML the LaTeX code according to this little JavaScript library. Let's try this. And this is nice. OK, so I can use here. LaTeX returns the length. And now I can specify how the length is calculated. So it is backspace opening bracket to start the LaTeX code and backspace closing bracket to end the LaTeX code. So here I can write now LaTeX square root of x to the power of 2 plus y to the power of 2. Yeah? So this is my LaTeX code. And I can generate again the Java doc for this project. It generates it for the whole project. Reload the web page, and you see a very nice LaTeX here. Okay, there's also a display math. Okay, it is backspace. the rectangular bracket, which will create a separate display style formula. Okay, so returns the length and then it's in display style. Yeah? So you can check whatever you like better. Yeah? So maybe I like to have it in line. So I can so I can write LaTeX in Java doc. Yeah, we may then use LaTeX in the Java doc. Okay, it's just because I have configured Maven to do this for me. And you see how how nice this build management tool is. I just write Maven test, he runs all my Maven my, my unit tests, I just write Maven Java doc, Java doc, and he just uh, generates the documentation. The next step is code style. Really, I wanted to also teach you to write code in a good style. And there are many conventions you know, that on the internet that you can read about. For example, in Java, a class name should start with a capital letter. Um, the name of then the object starts with a lowercase letter. Everything is in camel notation. Yeah. So the words are packed together and the new word is starting with a capital letter. Um, members should be private. Yeah. There are some conventions. And 
there are tools that check these conventions. And one of these tools is called uh, check style. So there are some useful conventions, uh, rules, how to write clean and robust code. And some of them can be tested automatically. Yeah? So this is called static analysis yeah? because we are not running the code. We are just looking at the source code. Uh, an example is check style. Another example is sonar cube. Sona Lint, you know, they are some of these guys. And you can run Maven check style check to have your code checked. And the configuration of this check style check is in a specific file, and that is here check style.xml. In some projects, the file has a different name. For example, if you look into my mathematical finance library and you search for check style. You see that I have configured the Maven check style plugin to take the definition from the file finmath check style.xml. And there is indeed this file here, which specifies which checks should be performed. Some checks are mild, some other checks are a bit annoying, and you can disable these checks. Yeah? For example, here is a check that a message should have not more than 15 parameters. If it has 15 parameters, that's maybe too much, and there should be some error or some warning. And here in our project, the check style file is that, and I have configured it also here with the Maven check style plugin. So the configuration is here in check style. And this is here the configuration of my file. Maybe I do some, some error to my code. Maybe I make here these guys public. Yeah? That, that is bad code style yeah? to have a member that is public. So now I can also run with Maven check style check. And he is now analyzing my code. And he's telling me, okay, starting audit, there is an error. The variable X must be private and have accessors method. So you should not make a member public because then anybody can modify the state of your object. All modifications should go through a method. This is a convention and it's specified in this check style XML that I would like to have this convention checked. You can also disable it. Yeah? It is here the visibility modifier convention. You can now go to the check style.xml and have a look. And you can modify this here. So you can dis also disable this guy if you like. Yeah? So uh, I could create other errors. For example, um, I could import some class that I don't need. Yeah. So I could import here, for example, uh, or all, all the guys from Java util. Yeah? I don't need it. Uh, actually, Eclipse is already giving me a warning. Yeah? The import is not never used. Yeah? Uh, if I run check style, he's giving me now three errors. Yeah? using the star input import should be avoided. Maybe I just import something specific. Yeah? So there is um, the list, yeah? but, I'm, but I'm not using a list here in this code. I can run check style again. Okay, so unused import Java util list. Um, I can also have, for example, Maybe I remove this error. And I also maybe remove this unused import here. Uh, I could maybe create now a getter, yeah? So public double get x. And it's convention that the method should start with a lowercase. So this is just returning the x. If I run check style here, he will, not 
mentioning this error, but instead he has now two other annoying errors. Line has trailing spaces. And if you like, you can disable this check because it is really annoying. There is in line 34 and 38 trailing spaces. So 34 is here. So you see there's a space here, right? There's a space here. And also in 38, there's a space. Okay. Um, I have the code checked on trailing spaces because spaces are a little bit annoying because Git believes there's a change, but actually there's no change. So it's nice to have the spaces removed. If you would like to have the spaces removed automatically, you can also take Eclipse clean up and have the project being clean up and he will organize the imports and he will also remove these spaces. Yeah? So have, if you have now Eclipse clean up, you see the space is gone. And if I run now check style, the two errors are gone. Yeah? but you can disable this check if it is too annoying. But still now you see, I have zero violations, zero violations, but I violated a little bit against this convention here. And the reason is that I have in my check style, the convention that the method name should be checked I have it disabled. Yeah? So if I enable this now, method name, he will now check the method name. I can run check style. And you see he's now complaining the method name get x does not match this pattern that it should start with a lowercase letter. So in Java, method name starts with a lowercase letter. And if you have this fixed and checked, you see now the code runs. And this is also nice. You can have this check style also run automatically on the remote repository. And there are even so-called commit hooks that disallow that somebody is committing something to the repository that is not complying here with this check. So you can really make the code clean. Okay, so we have automatic tests of uh, code uh, style. Yeah, continuous integration. I already mentioned this. I can have a server running somewhere in the internet, an integration server, and that runs predefined build steps. For example, compile, test, generate the documentation, check the style and so on, whenever you make a commit. And that is what we have already seen here. This is our integration server. Whenever I make a commit, he is some running some test. So this is called continuous integration. And to complete this session, I just have two other things here. One is logging. So it's also a nice style to use a logger if you would like to output something to the console, because then you can later disable this output just by a single configuration, the so-called log level. And I have another Maven plugin, the Java shell, which you maybe could look at, yeah, which is maybe not so important here in this project. And that was it for today. Thank you.